namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa I'm going to say a few words this afternoon on the topic of the precepts. Try to look at them from maybe a new angle. It's a foundation of our practice. The practice has three phases, sila, samadhi, panya, that is ethics, mental development and wisdom and ethical base is the foundation on which everything else is built and without a foundation in sila none of the rest will come to any fruit the formula for taking the precepts has the five precepts for lay people each term ends with Sikapadani Samadhyami, which means I will endeavor to walk this path of training. So that's the first thing to notice. It's called a path of training. Sikha is a student or a trainee. And Padani is from the root of to step or to walk. So to follow this path of, of training, which is quite different in spirit from a commandment or an injunction. It's not like a law laid down from on high. It's a advice from a good friend. And this is how we should train ourselves. It also further means that this is a path of training. Following the precepts is itself a practice that leads to a spiritual improvement. Whatever actions we do, whether they're skillful or unskillful, harmful or helpful, they spring first from the mind. This is where kama is made originally in the mind. And actions that are skillful or kusala, they come from the roots of non-harming, of kindness, generosity, wisdom. And actions that are hurtful, that increase suffering, they come from the three roots of lopa moha dosa, that is greed, hatred, and delusion. So by following the precepts, we're encouraging wholesome mind states. And an underlying method or, or mechanism, underlying mechanism by which this works, could be called a fake it till you make it that you're actually improving your mental condition or your inclinations. You're educating your inclinations is a phrase that I've heard, which is a fancier way of saying fake it till you make it. An example is, say, the first precept against killing. And I often cite this example as taking that precept to not killing mosquitoes. People in our culture generally don't concern themselves or think there's anything wrong with swatting a mosquito. But if you take that precept, then you should refrain from swatting mosquitoes. And at first, when people first take that, then they have to make a, a strong effort. The impulse is in the mind, the mosquito is biting me, I want to swat it and you better restrain yourself. But if you keep that precept as best you can over time, it becomes more and more second nature until you really develop a feeling of non-harming, ahimsa, harmlessness. 
towards the mosquito and if you accidentally kill one you might feel a little bad about it. This is the training of the inclinations by first regulating overt behavior and that improves the condition of the mental continuum. So just keeping the precepts by itself, just that alone, or even just endeavoring to keep the precepts is already a spiritual practice. And that is the underlying idea of, uh, it's related to the underlying idea of Kama in the Theravada Abhidhamma is that Kama is made in the mind at the moment of impulsion. And the action is just an overt expression of that. So the precepts are a way of regulating the overt behavior to influence the stream of the mind into a wholesome channels, into beneficial and non-harming, uh, not causing suffering channels. And we could say this, another principle we could say is that the underlying idea behind all the precepts is to reduce suffering to not cause suffering for self or others. Precepts are the formula or the formal expression of these principles in terms of specific behaviors. And there are different degrees of precepts. There's the five precepts for lay people, which is the fundamental basis of Buddhist ethics. There's eight renunciant precepts, which are taken by lay people on a occasional basis as an extra practice to encourage sense restraint, to form a basis for sense restraint. Although in Buddhist countries, there are also a few people who will take eight precepts long term or even for a lifetime. Famous example of that is Anagara Kadama Pala of Sri Lanka, who was a, um, around the turn of the 19th and 20th century, he was a, a major figure in promoting Buddhism and was involved in a lot of activities like um, petitioning the British government that ruled India to transfer Bodh Gaya to Buddhist control and also attending conferences overseas uh, promulgating Buddhism and he wanted to live a renunciant life but he felt the bhikkhu rules would hinder him in his activities that he wanted to carry forth for example he couldn't couldn't have money so it would make traveling more difficult so he took the eight precepts. Then there's the 10 precepts for novices or samaneras, which are basically the eight with the addition of not having money. And it involves all the major rules that affect the bhikkhu, but not the, the minor ones. And the 227 rules for a bhikkhu they're also called precepts, the bhikkhu precepts. And there's uh, even more precepts, and I can't remember, I should, but I don't remember the exact number for bhikkhunis. I think it's 240-something. There's a, for the female uh, renunciates, monastics, they, they have a different set of precepts. All these different sets are regulations of, of behavior. And the more extensive sets are mostly expansions and um, extensions to the five. So the five is really the central, central set. The first one is Panatipata Veramani. Sagapadang Samadhiyami, 
And where a money means abstain from, and that occurs in each precept. So the precepts are what we are abstaining from. And panatipata, the literal meaning is to refrain from the destruction of breathing things. So this is the precept against killing of sentient beings. And there are a number of matters of definition to be cleared up in every precept. The literal meaning here, breathing things, is not to be taken absolutely literally. It means animal life and human life, killing beings that have consciousness faculty. Plants are not included here. There is a Vinaya rule for monks against killing plants. Monks are not supposed to kill plants. But the origin story for that would seem to indicate it was because uh, lay people at the time thought it was disgraceful to see monks killing plants because the, the Jains and other groups didn't. So it looks like the Buddhists were less uh, strict than the other groups. And it was, it was said to save the um, reputation of the Sangha. Monks are not supposed to, to kill plants. Although there's another story that occurs elsewhere. There's two really two origin stories for this. The one I just cited is the one that's in the, um, you know, the main compendium of rules. But there's also a second story that says that a monk was chopping branches from a tree and cut the arm off a dewa. So this is a strange story that's, uh, and the dewa complained to the Buddha that, that would seem to, if not absolutely affirm, it seems to indicate a kind of animistic view that the trees had, a, had some kind of um, spirit associated with them. That chopping trees is not to be done by, by bhikkhus. But the precept for lay people definitely does not include plants. It's for animals only. And killing any living, living being of animal or plant life or animal or human life is a, a breach of the precept. And there, with all the precepts, there's degrees of seriousness. If you kill an insect, it's a lot less serious than killing a human being. The most serious is killing your mother, your father, or an arahant, which is classed as one of the grievous offenses that will certainly result in a rebirth in hell in your next life. And also as a matter of definition, a life is considered in the human realm and in the animal realm to begin at conception. So it would certainly be a breach of the precept to commit an abortion. There's no acceptability of that in the in Buddhist ethics. Also, euthanasia is not considered to be acceptable, although distinction is often made here between passive and active euthanasia. There's no requirement to actively prolong a life or to save a life. But any action to shorten a life is considered a breach of the precept. And as with all the precepts, the action must be done knowingly and deliberately. Meaning that if you accidentally kill something, then it's not, a, uh, it's not considered a breach of the precept. Depending on the circumstances, it might still be karmically harmful that by negligence you've 
carelessness, you've caused someone to, to die, but it wasn't deliberately done. It's not considered a breach of the precept. Which is another point here to consider that although the precepts and karma certainly have a, a very big degree of overlap, they're not exactly the same thing. An example of this actually in the Vinaya text is that for a, for a, a bhikkhu, we, we've already mentioned that they're not supposed to cut plants. But if, say, a bhikkhu gathers flowers to put on the shrine, that's actually karmically wholesome to make an offering on the shrine. It's a positive karma, but it's still a breach of the bhikkhu precept and rule and to be confessed. So there's not a hundred percent agreement between the, what's karmically positive and negative and the precepts. The precepts are the guidelines to keep us within the framework of good behavior, you know, karmically positive behavior. And it must be done knowingly. The example here that's often cited is stepping on a beetle in the dark. You don't know that you've done it. You don't even know that you've done it, even though it's still a, a death. And it doesn't matter to the beetle. It's still the same situation. But if it's not done knowingly, it's, not a, it's neither a karmically effective nor is it a breach of the precept. And it is a breach of the precept if it's done indirectly. If you order someone to kill something, then you're, you're responsible for that as well. And one of the examples in the bhikkhu's vinaya for this is because the first parajika for a bhikkhu is killing a human being. Parajika are the four rules that are the most serious, that if a bhikkhu breaks one of these rules, he's disrobed immediately by the act itself. He's considered no longer a bhikkhu. And killing a human being is, is the first parajika. And in the text that gives case examples for sort of gray areas to decide them, says that if a bhikkhu witnesses a public execution and he says to the executioner, please be merciful, sir, and do it swiftly, then he's committed a paragic of killing because he's instructed the executioner how to do the killing. If a bhikkhu makes a statement that privately or publicly, that encourages killing of any form of a human being. That in itself is an offense, but it's not yet a paragica until somebody acts on it. If somebody hears that and follows his advice, then he's indirectly caused that killing, then uh, he's paragica. The second precept is Adina Dana Veramani, which is literally not taken that which is not given. Dana is given and dina is to give. So adina, dana, not taking that which is not given. So this is referring to stealing. And it's defined as taking that which belongs to somebody else and they haven't given permission. When we say given, take, not taken out, it's not given. It doesn't mean only gift. It can also be a trade or something earned. But the transfer of the property is done with the agreement and concurrence of the previous owner is the key point. And any stealing would count here, including anything taken by fraud. Uh, this also is considered theft. The second paragica for a bhikkhu is stealing anything above the value of one kahapana, which of course becomes problematic in interpretation. Now, how much is a kahapana now? It's an offense for a bhikkhu to steal anything, but it's only a paragica if it's something of significance of more than a kahapana. So there have been different attempts to calculate the value of a kahapana in modern terms, which is pretty much a matter of guesswork. To, um, there are really kind of two ways in which you can 
attempt to approximate ancient values. One is to convert everything into the value of gold. And the other is to try and figure out approximate purchasing power of that currency. And both of these methods applied to a kahapana would seem to indicate something between 15 and $20. Although there's a lot of dubiousness and guesswork involved. But in any case, in terms of the second precept, it's stealing anything. And the precepts are all of them capable of refinements. So overtly stealing, taking something is an obvious breach of the precept. But even um, taking up somebody's time, wasting somebody's time when they haven't given you their permission to do so would be considered or could be considered, you know, a refined interpretation of the precept that you're pushing it there. The third one is kamisu michachara where money, which means refraining from improper sensual activity. And this is the precept regulating sexual behavior. And the definition that's given in the texts for lay people in the Theravada version is a fairly liberal standard. It's defined in terms of refraining from sex with an improper person or an unlawful person, which is defined from the male point of view as not having intercourse with a married woman, a betrothed woman, a woman still under the protection of her family, meaning you know, underage, and a woman who has taken vows of celibacy. So it's basically against uh, adultery. And by elimination, this would say that any other act between two consenting unattached adults would not be a breach of the precept. Although again, here, as with other precepts, there may be actions that, although they're not strictly speaking a breach of the precept, they're still unskillful in the sense of not promoting spiritual advancement. Overindulgence in sensuality in general ties one to the sense desire level of consciousness and doesn't advance one beyond that. So while promiscuity is not a breach of the precept, if it's always with a consenting unattached adult, it is not spiritually positive. It's, it's you know, keep one within the, the round of samsaric becoming. The Tibetan version is different of this precept. The Tibetans define sexual misconduct not in terms of unlawful persons, but in terms of unlawful orifices. And only the vagina is considered a lawful or legitimate orifice. So this rules out homosexuality altogether in the Tibetan interpretation. Now I have seen a, a discussion of this point that speculates that, and it seems like a sound speculation, the origin of this Tibetan interpretation is a misapplication of the Vinaya for the bhikkhus, where the rule, which is the... Um, Parajika of sexual intercourse with bhikkhu, any form of sexual intercourse is a disrobing or parajika offense. And it's defined quite specifically as the penetration of any of the three orifices. So it seems like the Tibetans took that and extended it to lay people and says, well, we can't ban all the orifices, so there'll be no no reproduction. So you know, one has to be allowed. There has to be one allowable vehicle for lay people. 
And the rule for monks here is in the eight precepts and ten precepts, the rule is changed from Kameso Michachara to Abramacharya Veramahi, which means uh, uh, Brahmacharya is the, um, literally is the, the godly or divine behavior. And it means celibacy. So the word for celibacy in Abramacharya is non-celibacy. So refraining from non-celibacy. So any sexual activity under the eight or ten precepts or the bhikkhu rules is uh, not allowed. The fourth precept is Musawada Vermani, which is the precept against false speech. And in the five precepts, it's specifically false speech, but there's another list of ten right and wrong courses of action. And that expands the speech rule to include harsh speech, slander, and idle babbling. But the emphasis is always on false speech. And this is something that the Buddha emphasized in different places in different ways, the importance of speaking truthfully. It's the, the most important element of, of right speech is speaking truthfully. And it's taken quite seriously because when you think about it, a wrong speech is really hurtful to the other being, the, the listener, because you are implanting delusion in their mind. So in some ways, in some way, it's worse than killing them because you're killing them and you just terminate this life stream. But if you plant delusion in their mind, it might confuse their mind stream into the future. But again, to be a breach of the precept, it has to be knowing and deliberate. So if you make a mistake or if you're mistaken yourself and you report something that's not factually true, but you believe it to be so, then that's not a breach of the precept. You're just making a mistake. And this precept is usually interpreted quite absolutely. There's no allowance made for white lies or bending of the truth to make somebody happy. It's uh, either tell the truth or keep silent. There's a concept that comes up in some of the commentarial stories. It's an asservation of truth, that someone will make a, a statement, a, a true statement, that by the power of truth, then they work some miraculous event, turn back a flood or something else, by, um, by boldly stating the truth. So this shows there is a very high value placed on uh, the expression of truth. And such a truthfulness is one of the ten paramis. And I think especially in terms of a parami, the very first element here would be truthfulness to yourself, being true, not succumbing to delusion or, or comforting yourself with, with falsehoods in your own mind, being courageous to face the truth. And you don't always have to, this is also applies to other precepts as well, there's no injunction of requirement of positive action. You do have the option of either speaking the truth or remaining silent. In the formula for the speech that a Tathagata would utter and not utter, it again starts with the Tathagata will always utter the truth and not otherwise. But then the next three terms are the Tathagata speech is always meaningful and not otherwise. It's always beneficial and not otherwise, meaning beneficial to the hearer or listener. And the fourth one is it's either pleasant to hear or spoken at the right time. So if a statement is true, beneficial, and meaningful, and would be pleasant to hear, it could be spoken at any time. But if it's unpleasant to hear, meaning it's some 
valid criticism should only be spoken at the right time. Otherwise, hold your peace. And we have some indication of what the right time might be from another source. And there's discussion in the Vinaya about when it's right to admonish another monk. And it's said that first, the monk who wants to do the admonishing has to examine his own behavior and his own mind to make sure that he's free of that offense himself. If he's not, then he has to clean up his own act or he's got no right to speak. The second point is that he has to examine his own mind and make sure he's free of anger and ill will. If not, he needs to calm down first before he speaks. And the last one is the trickiest. He has to try and determine as best he can whether the person he wants to admonish is ready to hear it and will take it in, in good spirit. Or if, if it's just going to make him defensive and angry, then best not to, not to say anything. So it's a pretty high standard. And the fifth precept is the one for refraining from intoxicants. And the Pali here is Sura Maria Majapa Madhadana Weramani, which means, uh, literally, it means abstaining from brewed, fermented, and distilled drinks. I'm not exactly sure of the order, if I got the order of them right, but that's what, that's what it means. So it was originally intended, in its simplest form, it refers specifically to alcohol. But there's something in the ethical standards, and it comes up a lot in the Vinaya, is what's called the great standards, which means that if something is not specifically covered in the literal definition of a precept, you can use an extension of the standards of, does, is this equivalency? Is this an, and it's often used in modern times in the Vinaya for things like um, monks uh, and money. Because the literal rule for monks is not to have gold and silver, because that was the coinage of the time. But by great standards, it covers paper money and uh, credit cards and so on as well. They're the equivalent in modern times. So the, by applying the great standards to the <clears throat> rule on intoxicants, that would include any substance that would tend to make you act in a foolish way. It's the original rule in the Vinaya, when this was laid down for the monks, the rule against taking alcoholic beverage, it was a monk who um, he was already a stream winner and he had psychic powers and he had done a service to the villagers by driving a naga out of their bathhouse. It seems that the nagas used to like to live in bathhouses and often had to be driven out. And the, um, the villagers got together and said, you know, he did a great service for us. We should give him something special when he comes on alms round. Uh, what is it that the monks don't get very often? Well, I know. Let's give him toddy, you know, an alcoholic, some kind of alcoholic drink. So every house he went to, they give him some rice and they give him a shot of toddy. <laughs> when he came back to the monastery, he was you know, quite, quite well gone. And he lay on the floor of the sala with his feet pointing towards the Buddha, snoring. And the Buddha said, what's happened to this monk? He was always so well behaved and, and uh, well mannered. And here he is lying on the floor like a pig. And the, uh, the other monks told him about the, the toddy. He says, well, the Buddha said, well, that's, uh, that's not to be done in the future. From now on, monks uh, to abstain from the taking of alcoholic beverages. That's how all the rules were laid down, by the way, in, in response to specific incidents. It wasn't laid down as a uh, one-off code. So by applying the great standards, this is the, um, the essence of the rule is that any substance that would make you act foolishly and do stupid uh, or harmful things is not to be allowed. So anything that intoxicates the mind. Now, some people have interpreted this rule over strictly and seem to think it means anything that affects consciousness whatsoever. So um, 
I've heard of people you know, not not allowing caffeine, uh, like tea or coffee, under and thinking that uh, is covered by the rule, but that's definitely not the intention of the rule. So I would think it would include things like marijuana or uh, opium, which would uh, alter the behavior. But even here, there's uh, leniency in that if anything that's used medicinally is not considered a breach of the precept. For example, monks who are injured are allowed to take painkillers, even if uh, otherwise they would be considered uh, covered under the rule. If it's medically prescribed, But it's also stated in the rule, in the discussions around the rule, that any amount of alcohol is considered forbidden. As I said, some people over strictly interpret the rules, other people over leniently interpret it and want to allow, uh, as long as you don't get drunk, it's okay. That's actually not the rule. I can remember in Thailand when uh, the lay people were taking the five precepts. It was quite funny. Sometimes you'd hear that when you get to the fifth precept, all the men are real quiet and the women raise their voices louder. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a Tibetan story that uh, you probably, I think, you may have heard this one before. It's a good one, though, it's a, on the importance of the fifth precept. There was a layman who had a reputation of being very strict and keeping all the precepts diligently. And he was walking in the forest one day gathering firewood, and there was a yaka who, who said, I've heard this fellow keeps the precepts really well. I'm going to test him. And he grabs the guy and, and uh, threatens to kill him unless he'll break one of the precepts here and now. So the fellow shaking with fear, this monstrous big yak has got a hold of him. And he says, well, what could I do? Um, I won't, don't want to kill anything. I know I'll, I'll break the fifth precept. That's the least harmful one. I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just to get away, I'll, I'll agree to that. So he says, I'll break the fifth precept. So the, um, Yaka magically conjures up a glass of liquor for him and he drinks it down and lets him go. And he's back to the village. He's real shooken up and he's feeling really like he's had a narrow escape and he's still kind of trembling. And he says, well, I've already had one shot. What, you know, I'm not going to hurt any, have any more. He goes to the grog house and has a couple of glasses of barley beer and calm his nerves. And then he goes home and when he gets home, he's looking in the cupboard for something to eat. Now he's hungry. He doesn't see anything. His cupboard's bare. But then he sees a, a neighbor's yard. There's one of the neighbor's chickens has got out of the coop and is walking around. So he doesn't see anybody around. So he's, he hops out over the fence and grabs the, the chicken and, and uh, takes it inside and wrings its neck. And he's starting to cut it up and cook it there's a knock on the door it's his neighbor's pretty young wife and she says uh, uh, have you seen our chicken it seems to have wandered off and he said oh no no I haven't seen it I haven't seen your chicken and by the way I'm just uh, cooking up some dinner do you want to have, come in have a bite and by the morning he'd broken all five precepts <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of the point is that you know, avoid the heedlessness that comes with um, with the taking of intoxicants. So those are the, the five precepts. And I won't say too much about the others, but just uh, a little bit on the eight precepts. The eight precepts are a different uh, a different basis in that they, they cover the five, they include the five, but they go beyond it to include precepts of sense restraint. The additional precepts are not eating in the afternoon, not indulging shows and entertainments or, or cosmetics and perfumes, 
and not sitting or sleeping in luxurious places. And the sexual rule is changed to uh, celibacy. So these are not ethical points. There's nothing unethical or immoral about eating in the afternoon. But these are points of sensory strain, which are a very big assist for doing serious meditation. Because when you're developing meditation, you're trying to transcend the sense desire level of consciousness and anything that keeps you diverted, entertained, or attached to the, the senses is going to hinder you from entering jhana. So the eight precepts are something that should be taken as an adjunct to a meditation retreat to encourage sense restraint. And in Buddhist countries, lay Buddhists will sometimes take them for longer periods of time just as an additional practice. It's common to take them on the moon days, for example. Um, or some may take a vow to keep the eight precepts for a period of time, you know, a week or up to three months or whatever. The ten precepts is just worded differently, so that the precept against entertainments and cosmetics are broken into two. Uh, it's only one additional restraint in the ten precepts. It's not handling money. So that's the difference between a lay helper at a monastery that keeps eight precepts and a novice. And the novice is cut off from the world of commerce and uh, has now entered the renunciant life seriously. And a bhikkhu has 227 rules, and a lot of them are extensions of the five precepts, refinements. For example, the rule that a bhikkhu can only have food that's offered directly to them is a way of being sure that it's not stolen or taken improperly. That's one purpose of it. It's not the only purpose, but it's, it's one. It's the, this extra level of scrupulousness. And the rules for the bhikkhunis are pretty much the same as those for the monks. There's some differences. A few of the rules relate to particularities of female biology. Uh, there's a lot of rules for both the monks and nuns around cloth and what's allowable for robes and so on. And there's a few rules for the nuns that add in cloths for use during menstruation. And there's also some rules that are for the protection of the bhikkhunis. In some ways, their rules are stricter than those for the, the monks. By their rule, they're not allowed to live or travel alone. They must have a companion. And the origin story for that was a nun living alone in the forest, uh, some bad character wandering through, found her and raped her. So then after that, the rule was they have to live at least in pairs. They always have to have a companion, which is not a, 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 not a requirement on the monks. But really the difference between the monks and nuns' rules is an incidental matter because the rules were all laid down individually on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, the same applies to the nun's rules. It's only when something came up and the Buddha laid down a rule. So they evolved separately, although they, they're based on the same principles. So these are the precepts. And a little bit on definition and purpose of the precepts. So the last thing I'll, I'll mention is the formal taking of the precepts. Now, that's a ceremony that's often done, is the, to take the precepts formally in Pali. And then, subsequent to that, the usual uh, or the advised practice for, if you want to take the precepts seriously, if you're trying to train in the precepts, if you break a precept, then you retake that single precept. And you don't need to take it for a monk or you don't need to confess it or anything like that. But just, you know, go before a, uh, your, your shrine or just in your mind, just uh, retake that precept, reestablish it. You know, I'm gonna, from going forward, I'm gonna 
refrain from that activity. So, I think I'll stop there. Sadhu, 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 and